Hey guys, what's going on? Welcome to another episode of Catching 101 TV. Uh, really excited for today's episode. Um, I think the guest may have one of the best Twitter handles on all of Twitter. It's Catching Pins. Uh, his, his name is John Penn. He was an uh, assistant coach at Old Dominion, and he's recently just switched jobs. He's now at Bryant Stratton uh, in the Virginia uh, Beach area. So w I'm excited to get on here and talk to you. We, we've exchanged messages a couple of times. Uh, but one of these things that's cool for me is it's just a, it's a good way to get to know more people. You know, sometimes I do these with people who I have a, a pre-existing relationship with, and sometimes it's people who I, uh, I don't know as well. So, John, I don't know you as well, but I've been following what you do online, and I like the things you posted, and I appreciate you coming on and spending a little time with us tonight. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm really excited for the opportunity and to break down catching with, with a guy like you, and I'm ready to get after it. Man, it'll be fun. So it, before we get started, one of the things that I kind of always like to do in the beginning is uh, if you wouldn't mind, just go ahead and tell people, you know, where they can find you, uh, your Twitter handle, if, you, if you're active on, so, you know, other social media platforms. Um, and then after that, I would love to hear kind of just your, your, your story, you know, wh where you started from, where you, where you got to, uh, to where you are now and, and kind of everything that's happened in between. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, obviously my Twitter handle is Catching Pins. Uh, I take that uh, creative, creative uh, ability from my dad. He's super creative, so I, I, I'm glad you like that. Um, my Instagram is Coach Pin with a K. Um, when I started out being a coach, I was actually a pitching guy. So I took Coach Pin with a K, trying to change it up a little bit on Instagram. Um, but that's where kind of my story gets started. I was a uh, Division three pitcher at Wabash College in Crawfordsville, Indiana. Um, and to say I had an average career would be a stretch. Um, I would say very below average. Uh, but as you get to know people, right, you talk, the, the people didn't play a whole lot. They learned a lot. And so I left Wabash in 2014, went on as a GA under James Grandy at Bluffton University, another Division three school uh, in Ohio. Uh, was there for two years recruiting, pitching, and catching. Um, got fortunate enough to work some camps. Um, obviously met, uh, did a, a Vanderbilt camp and got close with Blake Allen, who's now at DePaul, and Tim Corbin. Uh, and at that time in my career, I was uh, laying concrete. I, I didn't have a coaching job. I applied to 63 jobs. I had nothing. I was laying concrete, waiting for a job to come up. And I hand wrote a letter to uh, Corbin and, and Blake Allen, thanking them for letting me come down to the camp and talking with me and sharing with me. And I get a phone call a week later from Mark Raritan at Iowa Western Community College saying, hey, listen, we got a job open. Heard some really good things about you and your character. I want to hire you for, to work with catchers and hitters. And I, I said, Mark, listen, like, yeah, I'll do hitters or I'll do catchers. I'm, I'm excited to do catchers. I said, but I'm not a hitting guy. I was a pitching guy. He goes, we'll take care of it. <laughs> well, I said, all right. So two days later, I packed up my truck, drove 12 hours from Chillicothe, Ohio, where I'm from, out to Council Bluffs, Iowa, which is right on the river of Omaha, Nebraska. Spent two years there, took a team to the JUCO World Series, went 54 and 7 that year. Um, and through there and, and really learning uh, kind of the business side of things, uh, I landed a job with Chris Finwood at Old Dominion University, where really my um, catching knowledge was, was challenged by, Mark, by uh, Mike Marin, our pitching guy. I came in every day, he challenged me, like, what, what can you do that's different? What are you doing that's new? What do you, because, uh, you know, my dreams is to be kind of where Craig Driver is, right? Being a, a first base coach and a big league catching guy, like, it's what I want to do. So he would challenge me every day, and uh, he kind of was big in pushing me towards this visual training stuff. Um, and then after, obviously, Old Dominion uh, getting shut short with the COVID-19 season, they had to make some changes. And, uh, you know, I was gracious to, to get a, a job on at Bryant Stratton Community College here in Virginia Beach. That's awesome, man. And cool story. And it's kind of, you know, funny. It, it, it's small. It's funny how small the baseball world is and how just going and working a camp and, and building a relationship with a couple of people can lead to a lot greater opportunities. I, I would say there, there are a lot more people that that happens for than I think people expect, you know, um, a, a lot of young coaches uh, get out there, meet as many people as you can, network, a, attend events like the ABCA or other conferences, go to camps, work, just, just grow your network and, and, and good things happen happen so let, let me ask yeah, this absolutely i i i, I want to hit on a few things now you said um you know being a former pitching guy and, and wanting to dive in and using you know driver as an example i think he's a great one who's been on the fast track what made you interested in the catching side of it did you just get thrown into it or is it something you kind of always uh were interested in being a pitching guy just what was, what was the background there uh well i caught a little bit growing up 
Uh, I went to a really small high school, so I, I caught the first game of a doubleheader. I'd pitched the second game of the doubleheader. Uh, That's just kind of how it was. And when I went to Wabash, my pitching guy caught for Coach Strickland at Kent State at the time, uh, Will Vasquez. So he was a catching guy coaching pitchers. And he and I got really close. Like, anytime I go to Indianapolis, like, we still sit down and grab dinner. And, and he was a very large piece of me continuing to, to play, right? At the time, I was a two-sport athlete in college. I wrestled and I played baseball. And uh, I was on the verge of, of giving up baseball, to be honest. I, I was really unhappy with the way my career was going after my freshman year. Like, man, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? And Coach Vasquez came in my sophomore year, and he kind of grabbed me by the, the face and said, listen, like, you're going to work hard. And I'm going to push you. And this is what we're going to do. And our relationship's really tight. Um, but he was a catching guy. And so when I got the opportunity to go be a GA and be the pitching guy for Bluffton, Coach Grandy goes, hey, listen, you're going to work with pitchers and catchers. And so I started picking Coach Vasquez because that happened in January, February, my senior year. So I knew what I was doing. So I started picking Coach Vasquez's brain, uh, started doing all kinds of stuff. And then uh, I got into being a GA, and um, no offense to any, any pitching coaches are going to listen to this. I hated being a pitching guy. I hated it. It's really passive for me, and, and I'm not a passive guy. I'm an intense. I'm an in-your-face. I'm a, I'm a hands-on, like, uh, guys will – because I'll block without shin guards. I'm like, guys, this is what it's supposed to look like, and they'll just look like, why are you doing this? Like, it's just my mentality. Like, I want to get hands-in on it. And with pitching, it's hard. It's hard to do that. And so – I think I was always drawn to being a catching coach. Um, and because I'm drawn, like, I love it. Like, I, there's, I tell people now, like, I work with hitters, but I'm a catching guy. Like, that's, that's what I do. Because you can't just be one thing at a college level, right? Like, I, I get to work with hitters, but I'm a catching guy. And so, uh, I would – Will Vasquez pushed me a lot. And then when I got into being the pitching catching guy, I just was drawn more to catching drills. And you just do more, right? Um, there's just so many more – different avenues that you can go about with training catchers. It, it just, it, it drags my attention a lot more. Um, and I think that's kind of where, where it came from. Well, I'm right there on the same page with you. You know, it, it's fun, you know, being a catching guy, um, you know, you have a, you have a handful of catchers to work with. A college team is going to have, you know, three or four, if you're on a high school team, you know, through all ages and there's a JV, maybe you have, you know, six or seven, maybe, maybe your college program has a JV, squad maybe, so maybe there's a little bit more but but you've really got a small group you're working with so you get to be uh really intimate and really close with the, with a small number of guys um versus which god bless pitching coaches i mean obviously we need them <laughs> um but but those guys are working with staffs of you know 15 to 20 guys um and, and it's you know it, it's a lot of work and obviously i have a lot of respect for them um but i always love the catching side too I, i'm with you i always thought of myself as a catching guy first and you know and you hit the nail on the head coaches you wear a lot of different hats I mean sometimes you're an accountant sometimes you're a hitting coach sometimes you're the travel secretary um but the favorite hat that I always wore was catching coach so I'm right there with you um but but man that's that's all good stuff and I kind of want to get into the the main topic of what I wanted to speak with you about and, and before we started recording uh I, I told you and I, I want to say it again earlier in the year I can't remember which podcast or which call it was it was but uh I, I referenced something you did and I wasn't able uh, to point my finger at your name, my, my mind had gone blank. I remember, I remember seeing this drill on Twitter. I can't remember who posted it. So it, whoever's watching this right now, if you remember that episode uh, or that period, this this is the guy I was referring to then. But uh, but circling back around, you know, the main topic that I want to talk about is is vision training. And it's interesting. I put out a tweet the other day and I said, I feel like vision training um, is an area that, that catchers, you know, is underutilized, so to speak. I think it's important, but I don't think most guys – really work on it so uh I, I know i know you've done a lot of work and you've kind of done a case study and you've you know not just come up with some random drills but you you came up with things and you've tested them and you've kind of put them you know to work over the course of a season um and, and you're able to uh put, put a value on some things so i'm interested to get your thoughts there but let me ask you this first kind of before we get into the drills and, and your methodology um I would say, you know, vision training, it seems like that's that's kind of thinking outside the box a little bit. Most people, you know, you practice receiving, you practice blocking, you practice throwing. Uh, I would say catchers have so many different things that they have to do, you know, catching pins, hitting, all that stuff. Um, vision training is probably 
really low on the priority list for a lot of guys. And I'll be honest, I, I've, I've not emphasized it like I wish I had um, in the past because I, I think it's that valuable. Um, but, but what made you feel like th- there's something to this? That, you know, vision training is something that we need to work on with our guys. Was there a light bulb moment that went off? Or, what, you know, what made you kind of get into that? Um, I mean, you know, when you're dragging the field, your mind just kind of goes blank and you start thinking of things. And it just kind of came to me like, man, how can I help our guys make decisions faster? Like, how can I allow them to set themselves up to make decisions at a higher rate to allow them to have better glove path efficiency, to make faster decisions on balls in the dirt, to uh, be able to be, okay, no, this is a ball I just need to catch versus this is a ball I need to receive. Um, and so just trying to find ways to do that. And, um, I mean, you always hear stories of like the old time, um, air, uh, plane pilots and how they used to do calculus while doing jumping jacks, those kinds of things like, okay, like how, why are they doing this? And, um, I'll be honest, it, it, the, the first portion of it, the, the letter find came from, um, our athletic trainer at Iowa Western Community College, Joe Miller. They came back from a athletic training um, convention and we had a catcher who's going through a return to play from a concussion protocol. And that was part of it. They put him in front of a wall in front of uh, 10, 11 sticky notes with letters written on him. They had, he had to touch the letters and trying to understand, okay, why, why is he doing that? Why is that a part of return to, to play? And then, so just kind of taking that and evolving it um, really kind of set me on the path of, okay. And that's, that's funny. I, we had a freshman catcher show up in the middle of summer for some summer classes. So I started kind of, I, and I told him, I said, Jay, you're going to be our guinea pig. I said, you're going to test run this for the next eight weeks. And if it sucks, we're going to trash it. Um, and so like when it first started, I was doing like the ABC of the alphabet and there's one set up and like, it was just really basic. When I look back at it now, I laugh um, to where it is now. We evolved all the way from June when we started that through I mean, even when the, the season ended, we were still, I was still trying to find ways to make it interesting for our guys and new for our guys. So they wanted, and, excuse me, uh, Brock Galliardi, our, our junior college uh, junior from Washington was like, coach, I need to do this or I, I can't catch that day. Like it got to the point where he felt like it warmed up. He wanted to do it before BP. Like it warmed up his eyes and his hands so much. He's like, it just helps me see so much better. And it all came from just a, man, what can I do? And part of this is too, right? I want to make pro ball. Like, what can I do to be different? Mm -hmm. Right. You look at at the Kyle Bodies of the world who are, when he started throwing weighted balls, like everyone thought he was crazy. Like, what can you do that's different that adds value? And I remember talking with Craig, I think I met him at Ketricon a couple of years ago and I said, him like, listen, man, I've got this crazy idea. Like, what do you, what do you think? And he goes, I, I think it could be really cool. Like you could be on the forefront of things. And so I just kind of took it and ran with it. And it, it kind of just came from a, a law, a vast majority of like, man, what, what can I do that can help our guys be better? I think that's awesome. And I want to make sure that everyone, um, you know, fully understands, like I said, I've, I've seen what you do online. I, I know when you say letter find, I know exactly what you're talking about, but for somebody mm-hmm. who's listening to this, maybe can you take, you know, start us at step one, what is it? Uh, and exactly how do the players kind of go through it? Yeah. So I take, uh, the 26 letters of alphabet and um, I was a volunteer. So I bought little kid magnets. We had magnetic doors in our indoor. And so I took magnets and every day I would set them up different, different pattern every day with all 26 letters. And uh, I got to the point where I was setting up two sets so we could have, uh, two guys going at a time and it's in front of them and phase one of the training program is you're standing it's super basic you're standing on your feet you're staring at the middle of this this board with all these letters around you and you're allowed moving two things your eyes and your glove hand that's it can't move your head you can't move your body it's I want your eyes to pick up as much information as I can and then allow my glove hand so my left hand to manipulate towards that letter and it got to the point where I made guys thumb under the letter so they got in a habit of creating a glove path of if if z is the letter well I'm treating z like the ball I've got to get underneath it I've got to manipulate that ball and they're it's all spread around that was phase one is you're just on your feet phase two you went down into a squat um and the same thing and and it's 
a le- it's 26 letters. And I told you like it evolved when I first did it. The, the first baseline was we did A to Z and that all I had with me was my phone. So I went across the keyboard on the top row, middle row, bottom row for the second baseline. And then I went up and down vertically uh, for the third baseline. That's where it started. And then I was like, man, this is, this can get really easy if they're doing the same thing all the time. So I went into Google, I typed in randomizer, 26 letters, and I got 10 sheets of 10 different random letters. And it could have three W's in it. And it doesn't matter because it's different all the time. Mm. I just hand the guys a sheet as they walked in and stopped watches and said, all right, go to work. And they knew it was, they did this and hip mobility before practice ever started. Like it was done. They had to have it done before practice started. That way they were ready to go. Um, and then, so phase two is you're in your squat. Phase three, uh, you went to standing on a bozio ball. Um, again, I'm trying to create some chaos within your body. Like, okay, I'm shaky. How can I focus? Um, phase four was I, I did a, a crouch on, on a physio ball. Uh, and phase five was uh, I put a piece of tape and separated some letters top to bottom. And now if it's below that line, I had to block and center up that letter and then get back up and find the next letter. Um, and for us at the college level, right, we're a lot of block. If, if it's an off-speed pitch or it's two strikes or somebody on base, we're block first mentality. The guys even start saying it like, coach, I started looking at the, at the letters on the bottom first. So they started without just kind of organically working bottom up. And then that was great because that's, that's how we teach catch the baseball. And then when we got into the, the, the January getting ready for the season, I was like, okay, we've already done five phases. Like, how can I do this more? Uh, and so the different the letters are different colors. So now I started making them say from their crouch, say out the color. And okay, can I visually see it? Can I motorly function to it? But then can I verbally say what I'm seeing? Um, and then the the last phase we were doing is I set them up into the way we talk about our zones. And so now they had to say whether the letter was in a one zone or a five zone, because again, if it's a ball that we can manipulate I need to know what zone is going to be at exactly so I can get my glove around it and manipulate back to the center of my body Man, that's really cool and I want to give you credit because one I think you you thought outside the box to, to actually just get you know the little kid letters you know that are on you know millions of refrigerators across the country and, and use a catching drill with it um, but but you you advance the drill well beyond just find the letter and touch it. You know, uh, mm-hmm. I, I really like the, the aspect how you talk about you would have a line and the letters below the line you have to block. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the, the letters above the line you, you would, you know, receive, so to speak, uh, or, or tap it or whatever. E- even how you talk about working under the letter, I think that's important mm-hmm. as well. That, that just takes it one step further that makes it a little bit more, uh, a little more game-like. But I think in, in the mind of a catcher, in the mind of, you know, a player, um, I think they can actually see that relate, you, you know, where mm-hmm. a lot of drills sometimes, uh, especially the more creative you get with drills, sometimes it, it gets a little bit too abstract. And, and I think mm-hmm. something like this, you know, as you go through this progression, you know, it starts off fairly easy. It gets a little more complicated. You Then you start randomizing things and, and uh, it, it just gets more complicated and, and tougher. And I really like that. I, I've done some things there. Um, now, now you told me that, it got to a point where your players, your catchers, they wanted to do it every day uh, before the practice, before the game. So you, you always like doing this uh, pre-game or pre-practice? Oh, yeah. Like we threw it. And it, it's funny. I got to give credit to, to – we call them the hogs at Old Dominion, the catchers. We call them the mm-hmm. hogs. I got to give credit to the hogs, man. They, they took it and they ate it up, right? They started making it really competitive. So you'd have guys going at a time. And if one guy won, like he's talking trash to the other guy, like, come on, like you got to be better than that. And so then we started making – the two slowest times, like, Hey, you got to clean it up. Like, so they started getting after each other and that just like anything else, right. If you make it their idea, they, they love it. And so that's, again, it just happened organically and the guys ate it up. Um, so it was part of our, let's say it's game day. If we got a catcher hitting in group one, when he's done hitting, he would go with one of our managers and do his letters. So he would do it during BP. Um, and then when we get into our pregame work, then we're using the colored baseballs and things like that, that we'll talk about later. Um, and then if it was a practice setting, it was, Hey, before practice, if practice starts at 12 by 10 30, you need to be in here doing your hip mobility and your letters, because I don't want to, you know, how it is with catchers. You get 20 minutes, maybe that day to do some NDD. Like I want that stuff to be done because I think it's important, but that's, 
that adds into what we have to do that day. And so they would come in, they'd knock out their hip mobility and help keep them accountable. But I was every day. We did it every day. I like that, man. Anything you can make into a game where the players have fun with it. That's, that's the key, man. That's it right there. So let me ask you this. I know, I know from reading your tweets and following it, I know you said guys improved a lot, but maybe for somebody who wants to start doing this for the first time that they understand the concept, uh, but explain the scoring system, so to speak, maybe. Um, so that, like I said, if there's a high school coach or a college coach that's watching this and thinks that's a great idea and they want to implement it, you know, what, what would maybe be some of the beginning scores and then how do the scores progress as guys did a little bit more of it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when we first started, actually I got their baseline numbers here. When we first started as a group, um, we our a- average test was around a minute. Like the first time doing it was around a minute. To find all um, 26 letters, correct? To find all 26 letters. It took a minute. Um, and then so like you start seeing guys kind of creep down into the, into the mid-50s. And so if you're the guy that's over a minute that day, the guy that's in the, in the shooting a 58, like he's, he's, he's yapping at you. Um, but by the end of it. And so when I, I want to be very cautious of this. So when we did the baseline test, the three tests we did to, at the beginning versus three tests when we retested, we didn't do those exact 26 letter fines in that manner again until we retested. Cause I didn't want to be okay. Yeah. You got better at finding letters. Like I, did you get better? Mm. And when we did that, we averaged uh, almost a 30 second difference on all three, all three baseline tests across what four or five months. Yeah. Uh, so, so when your guys start getting good, they start getting into the 35, 45 range. We had one guy that was trying to get to 26. He was trying so hard to get to 26, uh, but always a letter to catch it. But that's, that's how good it got was guys were, if you were, you get to the point where if you're getting in the 40s, our guys are yapping at you. Like, God, 40s? Like, it's so slow. Like, come on, you're better than that. Um, and it was it was fantastic. So that's that's the range, right? When you first start out, I do it with some of my lessons. Like, you're going to get it at, like, anywhere between a minute and a minute 15, mm-hmm. um, depending on the age you're working with. And then as they get better, because what happens is they'll get frustrated. Like, why, why can't I get it below a minute? And so they'll want to be better at it. Right. And those are the kinds of kids you want to coach. So as they start getting, then they'll start getting down in the minute and then the 50. So I think if you can get them down anywhere between 40 and 50, so the 45 second range, if they get in that range, that's a really good range early on and then hopefully help them keep progressing. But you're going to see minute, minute 15 when you first start. That's cool. And, you know, one of the things that I'm noticing, I'm, I can't remember the book I read, but I read a book not too long ago and it was talking about um, people who have, like world-class memories okay people who can remember long strings of numbers like there are some people that memorize pi out to you know thousands of decimal places and there are some people that go through randomized i might say one three four so all throughout and you would memorize the string and the moral of the story was the most people could get to a particular number fairly quickly, but the ones who advanced and the ones who did well, they came up with, um, for lack of a better word, algorithms or systems inside their mind that they put to use. So when you talked about a guy working from the bottom of the zone up, that was the first thing that hit my mind. Like guys will, kind of, you know, self-organize isn't the right word, but guys will figure out how to improve at it. Um, and that's where I think it's really key what you said, you know, it's not just, I don't want guys to be good at finding letters on a wall. I want it to translate to guys becoming better receivers, which is kind of a good segue into one of the next things I want to talk about. I definitely want to talk about some of the other drills and colored balls and, and other stuff you've, you've done. But when you started doing, you know, drills like this, like the letter find and some other things and, and really started putting an emphasis on it, um, what was the difference you noticed on the field? You know, the guys actually, you know, receiving the ball. Um, I think the earliest this thing I started to notice was their ability to make the decision whether it's going to be a ball or a strike. Because um, maybe when they started, they were only making the decision 10 feet in front of them, mm-hmm. right? Well, all of a sudden, it was like, like they could all put it at 30 feet, at 40 feet. So they were able to make the decision whether this is a ball I need to manipulate or this is a ball I just need to catch. Mm-hmm. Um, and that really – made a difference in pass balls for us this year, right? When, when the season ended, we had four. Uh, and I did the math that if we'd have played a full uh, season, we would have ended up with uh, 13, which is 11 better than we had last year. 
which is phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's just because they were able to make the decision faster of, is this going to ball going to be here or is it going to be way outside my body? And I just need to get to it. Um, and it, I think that really helped because they were able to see the ball better out of the pitcher's hands. They were, because with the color balls, right, they got to focus on the ball out of the machine longer and they got to really focus. And I, I think they started to focus out of the pitcher's hand more. Mm-hmm. And that allowed them to make those kinds of decisions, not get beat on breaking balls, those kinds of things that really helped them manipulate the ball back into the zone. Um, and, and with some really good glove path things outside, like outside, and then like you saying outside the box, like it just helped them feel like they were in a position to be better. Makes perfect sense. And I'm glad you said that and kind of clarified because, you know, at first I think the natural reaction is to think about this as, as a receiving drill. You know, we're just, it's just receiving. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, it's not just receiving. It's decision-making and it's recognition, which is, you know, equally important for blocking and, and stopping the ball any way you can. So uh, very important there. Um, I, well, again, another thing, I, I keep I keep reverting back to it, but I really like how the players were asking you to do it. Like it felt like it was mm-hmm. part of their routine because it's one of those things, I feel like as a catching coach, there, there's a balance and there's a struggle sometimes where how do we get in X amount of work and how do I keep guys fresh and healthy? Um, because you can't just block a thousand balls a day. You know, you can't, especially mm-hmm. with your starter deep into the season, he, he can't catch, you know, every bullpen. He, he, you got to have to uh, pull the reins back a little bit and be smart with it. But this is a completely cerebral exercise. I mean, you're just using mm-hmm. your mind and you're using a sheet of paper, or you're using a wall. Um, so so I, I really like how you've done that. Uh, I did hear you mention colored balls a couple times. I want to hear you get into some of the other things you've done. Uh, maybe start with the colored balls, but I'd love to hear what other drills and what other processes you've come up with. Yeah, so the the letter find was, was part one of the, the visual training thing for the catchers. Part two was, I call it the chaos drill. Uh, we have a home plate machine that, uh, for those of you that are listening that don't know, it's a machine that you can program to throw a ball or a strike randomly whenever you want. And so I took 36, do- I took three dozen baseballs and colored a dozen blue, a, do- a dozen red and a dozen green. I just put dots, I put two dots on them. Um, about the size of a, of a silver ne- a silver dollar, um, a 50 cent piece. And um, we made red the trigger color. So out of this machine, if it was red and it was a ball in the dirt, it was a block and recover. If it was green or blue, it was just a block. If it was a receive and it was red, you had to transfer. If it was green or blue, it was just a receive. So not only do you have to be able to make the decisions, but you got to be able to call, call out the color of the balls as well. Um, because, I mean, you know, like if I'm sitting there thinking fastball's coming, I've got to see, oh, a guy's running. I got to know that this is a pitch I got to transfer on. And that's what red was. Like if red's coming out of the machine, that's a runner's going. You got to be able to get rid of it. And it's got to be clean. If it wasn't clean, you missed a color, you did the wrong action you went in the wrong bucket. If you did everything right, you went in the right bucket. On average, uh, when the catcher did it for the first time, we averaged 18, across the four, we averaged 18 and a half out of 36. When we did it for our retest, and we, again, we only did this drill twice, once for the baseline and once for the retest uh, in the fall. When we retested, on average, the catchers were 33 out of 36. We averaged a plus 14 and a half across the four of them on making the decisions on, on this chaos or using these colored baseballs. Um, and to me, right, the letter finds cool and the numbers are cool and the times are cool, but that was it. That was them being able to make a decision with their eyes first on what I need to do. Um, and so when that jumped like that, I was like, okay, hope I might be onto something. And that was um, over a period of eight, eight weeks or so you tested? Uh, between, let's see, we started practice in September. So between September and November. So, Okay. Uh, three months, give or okay. take. Um, and it was, I was just baffled. I was like, man, this is um, like, this is working. Like, this is unbelievable. And I, I started drafting something up in December, like, oh, look what we're doing. Like, this is cool. And I, I stopped. I was like, okay, this is great. Right. And then Mike Marin, he goes, it's great that your guys found letters faster. How does it correlate? How does it help? What, so like the, so what of it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm good point like what what now so I I challenged myself all winter break like how can I what can I do to make this be worth something other than just a a knack drill 
Um, and that's when I got into looking at the the 50-50 balls or the stride balls that, that Jerry calls them or the shadow box ball, whatever you want to call them, Savant. Um, we use Synergy. Synergy calls it one ball off the plate zone. That's where throughout the, the season between 2019-2020 that it was like, oh, like this is where it happened. And so in 2019, uh, overall – in those in that stride ball from all around the zone, we averaged forty three point seven percent of those balls. So the fifty fifty balls, we were only winning forty three point seven percent of those, way below the radar. In two thousand twenty, through sixteen games, we were winning fifty nine point six percent of those baseballs. That's huge. Yeah, that's sixteen. That's a sixteen percent increase of strikes. That that's that. Those are outs. Those are games that you can manipulate. That you can win just because I think because I can see better, I can make the decision better. I can get my pocket, be more efficient with what I'm doing because my eyes are ahead of the game. Um, and that's, that's where it was like, okay, this is, this is the real deal. Like this is, there's some solid evidence to, yeah, like, yeah, their numbers dropped and they, they did better on the chaos drill. Yeah. But look at the numbers of what we're doing for strikes, for our pitchers, for our team. And that's when I was like, okay, this is something I got to share with everybody. That's cool, man. And, and like I said, I'm just going to repeat you because because I think it's important. But I, I like how you you keep going back to you know it's not just a, a vision drill; it, it's a decision making drill. It, you know, mm-hmm. I, I feel like um, you know a lot of times, myself included, coaches, we kind of get caught up in the heat of the moment and we're doing the drill. And sometimes, sometimes you do it, especially when you're experimenting with new stuff. You know, you you do the drill and you want guys to get better at the drill. Um, but at the end of the day, that's not the goal. The, the, at the end of the day, right. the goal is for the guys to perform better in a game, whether that be, you know, stealing strikes or be blocking more balls or, um, or, or, or turning the, you know, the Z strikes or Z balls, you, you know. Um, mm-hmm. So, so I, I like the mentality there. Uh, I, I just think it's super creative, man. I, I really like it. You know, I, I know the season was short this year, and I know you said you've seen guys improve really quickly. How often would you do – I know the guys would do the vision stuff every day, but the, the chaos drill using mm-hmm. the colored balls, how are you doing that a couple times a week or how often would you perform that? So the chaos drill, we just did twice, maybe a couple times in the early February, getting ready for February 14th, right? We wanted to speed up our training less, like you said, less uh, drill, more skill as we get into our season, right? I want to amp them up, get them more. Uh, I forget the terminology that Tanner Swanson used more open drills, right? More things can happen, but we would use the colored balls every day, whether it's, we're just receiving sliders. Okay. Well, I I still got to be able to see the ball, try to manipulate my pocket, but I need to say what the color is every day, whether it's fastballs, whether it's sliders, whether we're blocking, whether we're doing transfer stuff. And if it's red, you're going to second. If it's blue, you're going to first. If it's green, you're going to third, just something every day they were using the colored balls for, um, the, some other things we we did with it was some rapid, some bare hand stuff. Again, rapid, how fast can you see what's going on? But still, and uh, the term I like to say, you know, I don't do the drill to do the drill. I drew the, do the drill to learn the skill. Mm-hmm. And so that was our thing. Like, okay, listen, we're going to keep doing this and we're going to keep implementing it. Uh, George Carroll with the Blue Jays was a guy I kind of bounced this idea off of when I first got started. And he was like, yeah, like, you know, well, that's something you could do every day. So I, we did it every day. Uh, because I wanted to find a way to, like you said, how can we make you, how can we help you make decisions faster to put yourself in a situation to be the best you can that day? And so I felt like if we did the, something that made them focus on the ball every day, that they wouldn't have a choice, but that become in their habit. So, so you actually incorporated it not into just only the chaos drill, you know, off the machine, but it would be in your receiving work. It would be in your blocking work. I think that I like that. And one of the things that I really like what you said, and it kind of, it's like a light bulb goes off in my head when I hear you say it, like, why did I never think of that? But I love how you have, Hey, hey, you know, if you block the red ball, you got to get up and throw throw the ball to first. If you block the blue ball, Mm -hmm. throw it second, green ball, you know, throw to third. I think that just makes a lot of sense. You know, uh, it's easy for, you know, we're going to say, hey, the drill is random. Half are going to be in the air. Half are going to be in the air. But in reality, it, it, it's when human beings are deciding it, it's never really truly random. That's another variable we can put inside the equation just to keep them on their toes. And you just can't cheat that way. You know, it's, it, probably right. makes it, it probably makes it fun for the guys, but it's also um, 
uh, also challenging as well. So mm -hmm. I'm a fan of that, man. I, I like that. Well, and you know, like it, it's very hard to say, okay, we're receiving today and sit down and catch 300 baseballs of, of just velo. Like you get really bored. It gets monotonous. You get checked out almost like going through the motions. And so I, I feel like the colored baseballs wouldn't let, like you said, wouldn't let you do that. Like I can't check out, like I'll do my six reps and then I can check out But for, for my six, eight that I'm catching. I can't check out. Cause if I say it wrong, the guy that's standing around me is going to, he's going to let me have it. Yeah. Right. That's, that's not blue. That's green. Like that's, that's your challenge. Like what, and so, like, the guys, it, it forced them to give me their best for that 20 to 30 minutes I got a day if. Um, and I think maybe – and you could – maybe that's the correlation to why the numbers went up because the work was more focused. I, I don't know. But I know they didn't have a choice but to have focused work because I found a way to use it every day. Well, you know, I've said it a hundred times, so I've said it once. I, I love the all-star equalizer mitt, you know, the mitt that has like half the pocket in it, mm -hmm. uh, simply for the, the same reason. If a player puts that on his hand, as soon as you put that on, it's like, okay, holy crap, I got to I gotta dial up a notch or I'm going to wear one of the face masks. It's, yep. the same th it's the same thing with, with the drills you're talking about where it, it just forces players to, to focus in at a higher level and, and pay more attention. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really cool. So, man, those are two drills that I would say are – they're interesting, they're creative, but they're really not extremely complicated. This is something that everybody at every level can do. You can get a couple of – you know – a bucket of baseballs and, and three Sharpies and, and put colors on there and do that. So, uh, you know, it, both these drills we're mentioning, I like them because they're inexpensive as well. You know, it seems mm -hmm. like, it seems like in the vision or the cognitive training world, a lot of these things are getting expensive. You know, the, the, the virtual reality stuff, um, you know, you have mm -hmm. to have an indoor facility. There's some video things that some are better than others. Uh, but, but you're just talking about high end stuff. You know, if, if I'm a, if I'm a parent of a catcher in the middle of uh, central Mississippi where I grew up, you know, you may not have access to, to those things. Maybe you don't go to a, a big college program or you don't have a huge facility that, that has all the latest technology. Um, but man, you can find a bucket of balls and a Sharpie and, and, and go to work or, or you can go to toy, I guess not toys R us anymore, but Walmart <laughs> and get, and get the, uh, get the letters that go on your fridge. So it, yeah. it's very, it's accessible for anybody, which is cool. Um, so it, it sounds like those are kind of the two, main things you've done are, are there any drills uh that maybe you tried and didn't work or anything you've experimented with and and maybe didn't have as much success you thought ah, i tried it but uh just just didn't hit it off as well yeah so I, in our our bucket we had the colored baseballs and we had lacrosse well, I had three different colored lacrosse balls an orange a yellow and a gray i think it was supposed to be white but we picked up from the lacrosse <laughs> team and they just left it out so it was kind of this blackish gray and so we started throwing that off the walls for, for some bounce back stuff. And, and, you know, they had to say the color of the ball that was coming off the wall. And then I tried two hands and would throw two balls and they had, and if I said orange, I had to figure out which one the orange one was and catch it. I can flip really good with my right hand. I cannot with my left. Like it was awful. And so like we did it for like a day and I, I stepped away from the, just because I, I couldn't, like it was just really hard for me to do. And you can't ask somebody else to do it because then it's not on time and all this stuff. So, we would still do the bounce back with the, with the one ball, but I, I just couldn't do it with the two ball just because it was really tough for me to try to throw one above the line and one below the line. It was just really tough for me to function left-handed, obviously because I'm right-handed. Um, but that's, that's one thing I was like, man, I, I'm out. Like it was, the guys were missing the ball all the time. Like it's just, it's not working. Um, and so that, that's probably the, the one drill went throughout all this process. Cause I was like, okay, what can we do different today? What can we throw against the wall and it stick and it, it helped us with making decisions. That was one of it just fell right off. Like, ah, we can't do that one. Well, I'm glad you shared that. Cause I feel like a lot of times, you, you know, you, you want to try, you want to, you want to think outside of the box and you want to try things that are new. Um, and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't, you know, which, which is the beauty of it. You know, if, if everything you tried worked excellent, there, there would be no discovery process. You know, you have to try things that, that don't work as well. Um, and I'm a big fan of the bounce back drill like you're talking about. Uh, I've used racquetballs mm -hmm. before because they come in a couple different colors. You know, you can get blue and red and green and, and all that sort of stuff. But lacrosse balls are, are about the same size and they do the same thing. Um, just to make sure that 
you know, people understand what's going on. And again, I, I've seen it and I know Tanner introduced it in a presentation at Ketricon probably in 2015 or so, but the drill is basically, you're going to throw a colored ball off a wall um, and, and the player doesn't know which color it is. And they're going to react similar like they would in your chaos drill or your colored ball drill. Um, and if it's, if it's red, they may receive it and do footwork to second. If it's yellow, they may, they may have to block or they may have to do a footwork to first or, or, or something like that. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, again, just another drill that people can do at home. It's super simple. Um, do you have any other favorites? Is there anything else you come across that you do, or is that kind of the bulk of the work you do with the visual stuff? Um, we do some with like the, uh, um, the plow care balls mm -hmm. and I'll throw in some tennis balls in it too. So they, they'll have to say like heavy, light, heavy, heavy, light, uh, just a different neuron trigger of like, okay, can I function, but can I also make a decision? Uh, I think I, I watched a video of Henry Sueto, a UFC fighter, was catching those three-wheeled spinny things, and his trainer said right hand red, so he had to take his right hand like he's throwing a punch and grab the red spinner wheel, and that was kind of like, okay, can I, how can we do this? How can I help them make the decision? So we, we get away from the color ball sometimes, but I, because they're, like you said, they're cheap, they're efficient, they, they can travel with us uh, to the point where they, we use color balls in our pregame routine. Like it just, we, everywhere we went, those things went. It was like your uniform, like the freshman catcher, like, Hey, listen, you got the hog bucket. You got to get the hog bucket and your catcher's gear and bring it with you because we used it everywhere. Yeah. That's really cool. So I, I want to go ahead and share a drill that I've been messing around with a little bit and I don't have a ton of experience with it yet, but I, I got marketed. Uh, I was on Instagram <laughs> probably a month ago and I saw something, an ad for something pop up and I was like, I got to have this. It's a product called blaze pod. I don't know if you've seen that or heard of it yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's basically a pack of, of six sensors uh, that light up different colors. Okay. And, and there's an iPhone app on your phone and you can program it to one of them will light up or you can have all six light up. Maybe, maybe five of them are blue and one of them are red. Um, but you can, you can do it however you want. And there's basketball drills and soccer drills and, and you name it. Um, and what the reason I got it was when I saw it, I thought that would be an awesome visual drill for a guy because you can put them wherever you want. You know, they, they do agility drills where a soccer player or a basketball player, they, they might all be lined up um, on the floor and you have to dribble and go tap, you know, when one turns red or one turns green, for example. Um, so, so they can do it where, you know, only one lights up and then you have to touch that. So what I'm working on with the catchers is same type thing as, as your letters where you're, you're sitting and I'm going to probably hit my microphone, but uh, you're sitting in front of the, in front of your sensors who are, you know, stacked however you want, organized however you want, and whichever one lights up uh, when they're on random, you have to tap it. And it scores it. I mean, it's literally on the app. It'll tell you your reaction time and all this sorts of cool stuff. Um, and you can also do it, like I said, where all of them will turn colors, but one of them will be a different color. Um, and, you know, so all of them are, like I said, red, for example, but one of them may be blue. And it's, it's the, it'll be the, the athletes or the catcher's job to touch the blue one um, and get your reaction time like that. So, so that's something that I've kind of been testing a little bit. Um, and, and I'm really excited to, to work with, you know, use a few more players as guinea pigs. Uh, but I, my, my wife was laughing at me. I had it set up in my kitchen in the refrigerator and they've got suction cups and I'm <laughs> sticking them on the wall. And I'm, she's like, what do you do? And I was like, I, don't worry about it. I'm just trying some new drills. Um, but, but even the, the things that you've told me have given me some good ideas for using tools like that. Now these things were about mm -hmm. 300 bucks. So they're Mm -hmm. On the affordable-ish side, not not out of everybody's range, but uh, n not in everybody's um, price range either. You know, it's basically the price of a new baseball bat. Um, right. But what I want to do with them as well is I want to incorporate some of the other things like you talk about where I can have set them on the ground and now I have to react blocking to them as well. So maybe I only have three set up mm -hmm. or four set up and I've got to, if, if they all light up and one of them's, you know, the odd color out, let's say they're all green, but one of them lights up orange. Well, I have to go block and get in front of the orange light um, or I have to do my right. footwork, you know? So, so there's a lot of different things you can do. And I, I guess kind of where I'm going with that is I, I feel like it's an untapped, Thing. I feel like there's not many guys working on the visual side or, or that are really um, pushing the envelope on the, on the decision-making side. And that's mm -hmm. why I was interested to get you on here and kind of talk about that. Uh, Cause I just, I, I think it's kind of one of those next wave type things. I, I think there's mm -hmm. a lot of people who um, they're going to listen to this and they're going to say, man, that makes complete sense. Why have I not been doing that before? 
Um, but I, I honestly feel like it's kind of the next wave of development. You know, it's not just uh, the skill, but how can we make this person an overall better athlete? And I think the decision-making process is, is a big part of that. Right. Uh, the the other thing that I, in the last couple months, I, I, I talked to uh, DNA catching. He called me, he wanted to pick my brain about this stuff. Um, the vector ball. Mm. And I, I, we haven't gotten one yet, but he said like, if you bounce it, it can change colors. And it's, it's just ads like if it bounces to you and it's red. Okay. Now it's a transfer. If it bounces to you and it's blue, it's just a catch. And it's just more tools. And I don't know how expensive they are. Uh, they're probably something that I got in my notes that I need to look up before I go on. Um, but that, that's another tool that you can purchase that can help you with the uh, decision-making process with the, the visual training. Like how can we, can, like you said, how can we continue to push this to new heights, to better understanding, to see if it actually works or not. And that's, those are one of the new tools that I haven't got yet, but I, I'm excited to get. I've got to order one as well. And uh, Brian, D, Brian Watley, DNA catching yeah. for everybody who's listening. Um, we can give him a plug as well. Uh, he, he, I, I asked the same thing. So I, after I sent that tweet out, he said, we use the vector ball. And I said, well, how do you use it? What do you do with it? And he explained uh, what you just said. I think that's another thing that's, it's super simple. You know, the concept of it is super simple, but man, it, it, that's a, that's going to be a challenge for players. You know, I, I would imagine when people first start, you probably get really frustrated uh, because it's new. You've never trained like that before. Um, but it's fun. It also gamifies it as well. So I'm with you. I'm looking forward to trying that. Uh, do you have any experience with any other devices? The one I wanted to ask you about is I don't know if you've used them or not. Have you ever seen the strobe glasses? That's those are so at Iowa Western we we didn't have the strobe glasses, but uh, Tyler Herbst, our hitting guy, took just safety goggles and took a, a permanent marker and, and permanent marked everything, but this real little just like I could barely see out of it. Um, but it was the same concept was I've, I've really got to focus through this shade to see the ball. So I've done that. I've done eye patches um, for bear. I, I haven't done eye patches off the machine, but I've done eye patch for velo just because, okay, if I can't use my dominant eye, can my non-dominant eye function like I need it to uh, or vice versa? Uh, I haven't gotten the strobe glasses yet just because it, I would hate to get a, get somebody in the bag, coach, I'm freaking out. Like, ah, okay, we're, we're not using them anymore. Um, but I think there's some value there because, again, it's all the focus. Like, can I focus through this? Can I get past the noise? Uh, George Carroll with the Blue Jays does that really cool drill where all the guys are standing in front of each other and they're moving their hands up and down. They're trying to chase the ball to do a footwork and got to get it clean. It's the same thing. Like, can I focus and, and my eyes do it and my hands function like they need to do while no matter what else is going on, whether there's a swing, whether he's falling across the plate, whether it's a double steal, like, can I do all that? Maybe it's snowing. Maybe the, the batter's eye sucks, whatever it is. Can I still focus and, and be, can I compete at my optimal level? And so I think the show glasses is another tool that I'd like to get my hands on just to see, uh, but I haven't yet. They're pretty cool. So I've got one pair um, and I'll go ahead and give you a little disclaimer. They are, they're awesome to do some drills with some drills are just impossible. So if you have, <laughs> if you have the strobe going too slow, you're going to, you're just going to wear, it. you have to have, you have to have the strobe going uh, semi fast. And what, what I really like using the strobe glasses for, or, the, or like the, uh, the reaction drills, like still bounce it off a wall, mm -hmm. because if you just set up a machine um, and the strobe's going too slow at all, you know, there, there's be a chance <laughs> for injury there, but you don't know until you try it. So, uh, you know, the guys that are, are looking into them, there's something that I recommend that I use at my camps and, uh, another thing, they're, they're just fun. Players love doing those. They love putting them on because uh, they're cool and they work. Um, I, I think the basis behind them, just for everybody listening, maybe hasn't seen them before, the, the strobe glasses is called occlusion training, which basically it's it's a an eyeglass, a sunglass that basically has a digital shutter and it's going to cover your eyes and then blink back up just like a strobe light would. And so what happens is your brain has to try to process the information because um, you, you're getting visual information and then there's there's a gap. There's a gap in the, the information that your brain is taking in. So your brain learns to try to fill in those gaps um, and basically predict where a ball is going to be based on the, proje the trajectory of, of where it is. So I know it's kind of crazy and a little scientific sounding, but, but they're pretty cool uh, tools. So I, I definitely like the strobe glasses. Um, I, I've seen another a number of other drills where some people would just have colored beads on a string 
like literally they might have a, a red, blue, black, orange bead and it's, it's hung on the wall. And imagine I'm staring and I have the, the string right here and a coach might just say orange and you have to, you know, put your focus right here on the orange, then maybe black, maybe black's a little bit deeper. It helps with depth perception. Um, so I, I know there's a couple of visual training guys that they probably focus more on the offensive side, uh, but I've seen mm-hmm. guys do drills like that. And any, any of these tools, you know, it's, it's funny. They're mostly so affordable, you know, a string and beads from a hobby shop. That's not going to cost you more than, uh, I mean, like three bucks max, you know, right. but, that's, but it's something that can help you out with there. Um, so, so really cool ideas, man. I like hearing stuff like that. Uh, I think, I think the vector ball is good. I think using the string is good. Strobe glasses, if you can get your hand on them, I think those things are good. Um, anything else that you would, you may be looking forward to trying that you haven't tried yet? Um, not yet. I think the, the challenge for me is just like anything else. Like how can I take this the next step forward? Like I'm going into a new program. So it's it's not like I've got guys coming back and okay, they're starting back in phase one, but I still want to, okay, how can I advance this? And so looking, maybe using, um, the Kenovia for some glove path efficiency, like using that as a metric of, did this get better or not? Um, is something I'm looking forward to. I've got a, uh, GoPros on my list of things to go get so I can upload some decent film. I, I'm, I'm Android family. So my video is ah. not always the cleanest. <laughs> that's all, that's uh, but, all right. <laughs> but I, I want to get a GoPro so I can get some good clean video for some, for some GPE just to continue to add a metric for guys. Even if they're like, man, coach, where does this really help? Well, let me show. So I can just be like, let me show you where it helps. Let me show you why this is helping. And I think, Going into it in year two, it's going to be easier because I've got some statistics of this is what the guys did the year before. Like, it's not – like, when this is doing this in the fall, like, people would ask me all the time, like, hey, you know, how's it going? I really don't know. We're going to find out in a couple of weeks. Uh, but, like, now I know. Like, like, it's worked. Is it going to work again? How can I keep improving it? How can I keep getting better so I can keep staying in front of that, that wave to the point where, you know, not that I want to be the Kyle Buddy, but where I'm that guy for – this kind of thing. And I, I, I think that would be um, useful just because it's going to continue to help guys develop. Right. And that's what it all comes down to is how can we help guys develop to whether now that I'm a junior college, help them get to their dream school or get drafted, or maybe it's just be a better driver when they're 80, uh, whatever it is. Like I just want to help them develop on the field and off the field. And I think doing this is really going to help us do that. Well, like I said, I'm on board with it. You know, it's one of those deals that um, it's been on my mind a lot lately because I feel like it's an area, you know, just to repeat myself, I feel like it's something that, that most coaches probably don't put as much emphasis on um, that should be placed on. But but all these drills, for the most part, can somewhat be um, translated into hitting drills as well. And don't get me wrong, yes. you know, we're talking catching. But it would be very easy, you know, if you're a hitting coach to, to – to work on similar drills where you have your auto feed machine, but you know, the players have to take every time a red ball comes out, you know, or you, you just, mm-hmm. you don't swing at the green ball or whatever the, the stipulations and the rules you come up with. Um, it's easy to translate these into hitting drills as well. And I, I know some guys on the hitting side, you know, do vision training or visual work. Um, mm-hmm. But I just don't see it very much on the defensive side. And, and that's why I feel like it's, it's just kind of in its infancy. You know what I mean? Outside this conversation, I think I've had one other conversation, you know, that was really in depth about vision training, you know, for catchers. And, you know, it's kind of like I'm scratching my head, like, why is this not more of an important, you know, thing? Why are more guys not, not working on this? And this is something that I think, uh, you know, the drills that you spoke about earlier, they're super simple to set up. For the most part, they're very inexpensive. There's no reason not to do it. I mean, I, I couldn't, mm-hmm. I, I couldn't think of a reason that say, hey, it's not cost prohibitive. I'm not saying that you have to go out and get the the blaze pods and the strobe glasses. You don't have to spend a thousand bucks on slow motion camera. You know, it's all super affordable, uh, super easy to set up. Especially now, the the you know, I know most places across the country are starting to play ball again. But if you're a parent mm-hmm. listening to this it would be easy to set this stuff up in your basement, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's the, the beauty of it, right? Like you said, you can, our hitters are coming all the time. Like, man, JP, you think this could help, you know, you think this could help us with hitting? 
yeah, like it, it's all about making decision. Like how soon can I, um, you know, you, you stand in for a bullpen, you're not swinging a bat, but you're standing in a bullpen doing yes, no drill. What are you trying to decide? Whether yes, I'm going to swing or no, I'm not. Mm. Same thing. And whether it's, and that's where the colored baseball is. Like if you're a high school coach, if you're a college coach and you're listening to this, like invest in, and they don't have to be pearls, but like get some decent baseballs, a bucket of them, and just you and your managers or send it down to your volunteer, or your, your, your bottom guy, your ops guy, if you want, and just make him draw colored dots on these balls because they're going to help. They, they have, like you said, they have to, even if I'm not swinging, but if they're putting out a machine and I'm just watching them like blue, the earlier I can make the decision, the better hitter I'm going to be. And so I think that if, if, and if you're going to take anything from this, get some colored baseballs and make them a part of your, what, wherever we go. Cause if you're inside, if you're outside, you can use them everywhere. Yeah. So w- with that said, you know, I, I know all these things are very affordable and everybody should be able to do all of it. Um, but if you had to pick one drill, what, the letter drill, um, you know, where you have uh, the, the random letters on the wall or you had to pick the colored balls, which one would be your favorite? If I, if I went and asked your catchers, like, Hey, what, which one's the most valuable, which one do you think they would say? Uh, they're probably going to say the letters because I would write them all the time. Like, Hey, did you get your letters in yet? Like, what'd you score? Um, but because it's back to the decision making, I think it's the colored baseballs yeah. because that that is the step, and that's the the thing, right? As as catching coaches, how can we make it as game like as possible without being in a game? How can we speed up our catchers to to pass the the old Oregon um, football? Like, how can we get you past game speed so that the game slows down? And that's where I think the colored baseballs come in because it, it speeds you up. I've got to do so many things at once. So oh, I just have to catch a regular baseball. Like oh, this is simple. And so if I had to pick one thing, it would be taking the colored baseballs and doing whatever drill out of a machine or the, out of a hand that you can do with it. I love that, man. It's great info. Um, we've been going almost an hour, so I'm going to let you off here in a minute, but I got one more question for you. Do you, do you ever do anything else? Um, I, when I posted that tweet the other day, uh, you know, I got some different responses. You know, like Brian talked about the vector ball. You, I know I've mm-hmm. seen your stuff before. That's why I was interested to talk to you. A number of people said they like to have their catchers uh, you know, be the umpire during a bullpen mm-hmm. and actually get behind the catcher so they can track and see how things, you know, see the visuals of a catcher receiving. Is that something you do as well? Yeah, I think, uh, especially if you've got, let's, we had four guys, right? If you got three machines, you got a guy standing around, instead of that being dead time, just make him get behind somebody, especially if working with a guy that's really struggling on that uh, arm side fastball, trying to get that pitch a strike, trying to get my pocket around the ball. Like, have a guy stand behind him and then can, like it forces them to talk. Cause all of a sudden the guy receiving will be like, Hey, what are you seeing? And he's like, Oh, I'm seeing it really extended or I'm seeing you that you're just getting beat by it a little bit. Like I think it forces guys and I've done this with lessons. I've made them get behind me. Okay. What are you seeing? And for the guys that have the advanced minds that, that we all want to coach, we all think we're coaching. They're going to pick up on things just by watching because in today's day and age, especially with right now, unless you're up at four o'clock in the morning, you're not watching baseball. There's no, there's no baseball to watch unless you're catching in on some KBO. And so it, that, that aspect is lost almost because you'll ask guys like, Hey, like, did you watch any baseball last night? No, nah, I played call of duty instead. Well, this forces them to watch. And, and I think if you watch if because you, you're in the game enough, there's so many games. If you watch enough, you'll pick up on things, right? Like I'm really excited to see what the difference is in Gary Sanchez this year. Right. If, if we get a chance to see it, um, because he's a guy that, because where we are, we get a lot of Yankees games. Like, now I'm excited not just because I love Tanner, but like, what's going to be different with him, and and why, and how is it going to improve? And so, if you start seeing guys going, "Wow, Gary Sanchez is actually a good catcher," like, what's why? Why is he a good catcher? Why does he suck less now? Well, he's doing this with his glove. Ah, uh, that's funny because that's the same thing I'm trying to get you to do. This is the same thing if you make a guy stand behind an umpire because they start watching things. Like, you see that thing he does off his left knee where he does that elbow drop? That's the thing we're trying to get you to do. And maybe they start doing it. And, th- and those kind of things, I think, always help if you can put them in the situation where they have to see more of it. Well, I'm right there with you. And, and I would say I'm probably a little bit less optimistic about Major League Baseball being played, especially with some of the recent statements that have come out. I, I don't know if baseball is going to happen this year or not. I, I hope it does. I keep my fingers crossed, but uh, I, I don't know. If it will. But, but I'm with you. I, I like watching the Gary Sanchez. I, I like him trying new things. Um, mm-hmm. Another thing, I think I spoke with it 
I think Craig and I spoke about it recently or spoke with somebody about it. Um, but when you see a guy like Salvador Perez, you know, a video of him recently that's posted on Twitter, I think uh, Tyler Goodrow posted a video and I've seen a few other people post it where he's, he's completely revamping his receiving style. And one of the things that just I find so impressive about that is we're talking about guys who are at the top of their game. I mean, Salvador, he's been MVP. I mean, he's got all these accolades under him. Uh, Gary Sanchez, I mean, you know, the talent that guy has. But these guys are still trying to get better, you know, and that's kind of mm-hmm. where the catching world is right now. It's a fun time yeah. to be a catching coach uh, because I think for a long time it was just kind of – it was kind of stagnant, you know. There wasn't a whole mm-hmm. lot of movement or adjustment. It was just kind of we're going to do what we've always done and that's all there is to it. But now you're seeing guys – like you, the two couple guys you mentioned, like Craig, he's – He's revolutionizing some things. Tanner, he's revolutionizing things. Um, you, you know, so we're, we're getting we're getting some interesting uh, views and in watching guys at, at the highest level that are open minded and willing to change. And obviously, they're doing that because they think it's going to make them better um, and and hopefully translate into to more wins and you know more championships and bigger contracts and all that stuff. Um, but it's definitely a fun time to be a fan of catching and a catching coach. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm with you, man, all this stuff I'm completely on board with, uh, yeah. And that, that, I think that's the one thing that's really cool about the catching realm, right? The, I was having this conversation with one of our assistant coaches the other day, the hitting Twitter world is at a civil war with each other, right? Like they, one side launch angle, one side's not the pitching world's kind of starting to even out a little bit, but there's the old school mechanics versus the new drought. Like it's all across the catching world has never been since I've been, since I've really, and like you said, in the last what, five years, it's really taken off. Um, and part of that, I think, is catcher con, right? I think that's, uh, I love convention, right? It's, it's great, but you might get one catching guy, maybe two. When you go to catcher con, and, and this is a, a, a jab out there for you, you get a whole, like three whole days of catching. Like if you're a catching guy and you haven't been there yet, like it's like Disneyland. Like you got to go just because it's, that's what we want to talk about. And like you said, everyone's so open and so vulnerable and so, like, oh, you know, I listened to the shoemaker at Campbell talk two years ago. Like his stuff was just like, wow, man, like this is awesome. Um, you know, and then you got the, the, the crazy Tom Griffins out there that are doing all kinds of other, but like, it's, it's great because there's value in all of it. And, and more than anything else, like each catcher is a snowflake. Some guys can be one knee guys because they got bad hips. Some guys can do it because they're athletic. Some guys, they, they shouldn't be. They're the hybrids. And, and trying to find that within the catching realm is easier because I think there's more people like you that are open to, to sharing ideas and open to just having open conversations. Be, and, you know, the, the COVID stuff that, that uh, Tanner was doing where they're having a different guy talk every week. And that's what I just kept feeling that way. Like, man, these people are just popping on here and sharing information just because they want to help or you go in the football realm and like, I, I'm not going to share my offensive playbook. I'm, I'm not going to share my recruiting styles, but like with catching, like everyone's so open and, and um, you could call somebody up right now and they talk to you about it. And like, that's, that's what I think is really unique about the catching position because it's such a, in my opinion, a blue collar position. And I think the coaches that are in it see it that way. And that's why they're so open to help. And they're so just good old down home people. I'm I'm right there with you, man, and I appreciate you saying about CatcherCon. That means a lot because that's kind of that's my goal for it. I mean, I just want people to be able to share information and people to be able to, uh, you know, meet the people that you see online or you, maybe you don't have an opportunity to meet anywhere else and, and just and just talk and share. So uh, I'm with you about that, but I, I'm with you on the uh, hitting Twitter, pitching Twitter. Um, I hate to say it. I feel like strength training Twitter is almost trying to overtake uh, hitting and pitching Twitter. But, but yeah, there, there's something cool about the catching community uh, where, where people are just open. And it's just, for, for lack of a better word, it's just a bunch of – it's a good group of dudes. You know, it's people mm-hmm. who, who like to share. Um, they, they, they lift each other up. Uh, there's no competition. Um, there's, there's no egos in it. It's just a bunch of good dudes sharing ideas and all trying to get better. So, so I'm with you and I definitely appreciate you saying that. Um, but John, man, this has been a blast. So the drills that you shared tonight are phenomenal. There's nothing short of phenomenal. Um, I, I, I would be, I hope everybody who's watching or listening to this, you know, take his advice, go get some colored balls, uh, you know, buy the letters from Walmart in the, in the baby section uh, and, and start working on this stuff. And I'm interested to see 
uh, more people's results as they start to track it and kind of like you've done. It sounds like you're kind of on the forefront of this right now. Uh, you're doing a phenomenal job. I'm going to go ahead and uh, challenge you to continue to be creative because you've done a great job so far, but, but I want to catch up with you in another six months or so and, and see what you've done, you know, above and beyond this. Uh, so man, I, I appreciate you coming on here and taking time. Um, you know, best of luck with the new job. And uh, I definitely want to talk to you about this stuff again soon sometime. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate the opportunity. And uh, like I said, my, my, my Twitter's catching pins. My Instagram's coach pin with a K. If anyone on here is listening, watching, you got questions. Like I said, man, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, all ears. I'm open. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to, to share and talk and learn and, and continue to grow. So I appreciate it. Well, I'm definitely going to put your, uh, your Twitter and Instagram handle on the screen. So it should be easy to find for people. Uh, but John, man, thanks again. Like I said, I don't want to take up too much of your time. We've been going a little over an hour, uh, but awesome info. Really appreciate it. And uh, definitely look forward to talking to you again soon. Yep. Sounds good. See you soon.